Welcome back everyone, I'm Nick930, and to celebrate the upcoming release of id Software's Doom Eternal, I want to share with you the complete history of Doom. Doom is hands down one of the most iconic first person shooter franchises of all time and has influenced hundreds of video games with its revolutionary gunplay mechanics, over-the-top violence, and competitive multiplayer deathmatches. Each title in the series centers around an unnamed space marine on Mars and its surrounding moons, who's forced to face off against an invasion of demonic creatures straight from hell, using a variety of weapons like shotguns, rocket launchers, and chainsaws. The series is often credited for popularizing the first-person shooter genre, and to this day, continues to thrill gamers with its smooth combat and unapologetic levels of insanity. So how did a series with such an absurd premise get to be so insanely popular? And how has it managed to persevere for nearly 27 years? To answer that, we need to start by taking it way back to the original game in the early 1990s. In 1991, id Software had started to make a name for themselves with their first breakaway hit, Wolfenstein 3D that established the basic format for the first-person shooter genre. As I detailed in my documentary on Wolfenstein, id Software's lead programmer John Carmack utilized a sophisticated technique referred to as raycasting that creates the illusion of a 3D space by utilizing 2D level data. While certainly an impressive feat, the technique limited the game to very basic level structures without any sort of verticality. To overcome these limitations, Carmack had already begun working on the next revolution in the FPS, with a more complex engine, capable of calculating vertical 3D space. The question now was, what kind of game would they make to incorporate this complex design? They considered both a new Commander Keen game, their more child-friendly platformer series that they worked on in the past, and even another entry to Wolfenstein, but ultimately settled on doing something more original and much darker. Using their in-progress campaign of Dungeons & Dragons as inspiration, lead designer Tom Hall built a massive design document for their next project, titled Doom. Doom was intended to be unlike any video game that had come before it, with a seamless large world to explore, complex cinematics, and deep lore all brought to life with Carmack's new engine architecture and their revolutionary first-person shooter gameplay mechanics. But when Carmack was shown the document, he dismissed the idea of focusing on the story, famously saying, story in a game is like story in a porn movie. It's expected to be there, but it's not that important. Many members of id sided with Carmack's view on story, ultimately leaving Hall feeling isolated from the team, as he worked to reconfigure his design for the new gameplay-focused direction. By the start of 1992, full development for Doom had begun. Using Carmack's early version of the new engine architecture, both he and Romero began designing environments, experimenting with the tools with angled walls and complex architecture. Meanwhile, two artists, Kevin Cloud and Adrian Carmack, worked on the design of the game's models. Many of the monsters were created using clay molds that were then scanned and placed into the game as two-dimensional sprites. For the more complex models, they even hired a professional Hollywood monster maker to build sculptures using latex and metal components, giving them an even more unique look. Within the first month of development, id were able to piece together an early tech demo for the game, with a complex heads-up display to simulate an advanced soldier's helmet, along with a few animated monsters and basic environments. Throughout the course of the next few months, the developers expanded the scope of the experience significantly. Level architecture became more complex, more enemy and object models were scanned in, and Carmack was forced to incorporate a new rendering technique called Binary Space Partitioning allowing for static map elements to be drawn more efficiently. With this new tool at their disposal, id Software began to rapidly piece together the rest of the game throughout the course of the next few months. Levels became even more complex, more weapons were introduced, AI movement and hit points were coded in, and new flying enemies were incorporated to help add variety to the action. By the end of the summer, it had become clear that Tom Hall's vision for Doom differed too greatly from the rest of the development team, and he parted ways with the company in August of 93. Following his departure, Sandy Peterson and Dave Taylor jumped on board, who assisted with additional gameplay elements including the game's auto-map system and wrapping up the level designs Hall had left behind. In the final months of development, the team worked tirelessly to finalize the project, 
They did away with things like collectible unholy treasures and incorporated new multiplayer components including the ability to play the entire game cooperatively and the revolutionary competitive deathmatch that allows players to fight each other in specialized arenas. Finally, only a few weeks before the holidays, their passion project had been completed, and id Software released the first episode of Doom, a game that would forever change the gaming industry. Doom takes place in the future, on a series of large facilities built along the surface of Mars and its surrounding moons. The player assumes the role of an unnamed space marine, who is stuck providing security in a waste management facility after assaulting his superior officer. Meanwhile, the Union Aerospace Corporation, the ones responsible for building these large space facilities, have been conducting a series of classified experiments involving interdimensional gateways. But after UAC scientists mistakenly open a gateway to hell, demons begin to invade the area, killing everything in their path. The player's character, colloquially referred to as the Doom Guy, ends up being the sole survivor of the incident, and is forced to fight through hell's forces in order to escape. It's a simple narrative, one that's delivered entirely through short text excerpts at the beginning and end of each episode. But its simplicity is exactly the reason why it works, as it avoids asking how or why and just lets players respond with plenty of hot lead. The game plays a lot like id Software's previous work, with the ability to move around a 3D world in first person and a main objective of reaching the level exit with the bonus challenge of finding all the pickup items and killing everything that moves. But unlike Wolfenstein, Doom features more gameplay variety. Weapons, for example, now range from standard firearms like a pistol, shotgun, and chain gun, to more extreme armaments like the chainsaw, the rocket launcher, the plasma gun, and of course, the BFG-9000. To complement these weapons, Doom features a diverse cast of demonic foes. The game starts off slow, introducing enemies like zombie soldiers and fireball-throwing imps, and gradually introduces more challenging enemies like the demon, aka Pinky, their invisible counterparts, the flaming Lost Souls, the floating cyclops Cacodemon, and of course, the towering Cyber Demon. Each enemy offers their own unique attacks and vulnerabilities, forcing the player to carefully juggle their weapons while constantly moving to avoid taking damage. If the player does get hurt, they'll lose points to both their armor and health, and just like in Wolfenstein, we'll need to collect items in the environment to stay alive. Along with health and ammo pickups, players can also equip power-ups that bestow special abilities. The Berserk power-up, for example, replenishes the player's health and gives them increased strength to punch enemies into paste. While other power-ups, like the Radiation Suit, help players traverse the game's many treacherous level environments. Speaking of which, the environments play a massive role in Doom's gameplay. In Wolfenstein, players need to open doors, shoot enemies, and occasionally search for keys to open more doors. Everything was flat and straightforward. But Doom offers verticality to its worlds, adding a new dynamic to the movement. Players can fall off of ledges and need to find either rising platforms or short stairs to climb back up. Enemies can also be located at variable heights now, and while the player still can't look up or down, they can fire straight at an enemy and automatically target them regardless of their elevation. The environments can also be manipulated using wall-mounted switches that often cause large platforms to appear or doors to open. This increased verticality, highly varied enemy configurations, and unique arsenal all make Doom a far more interesting shooter than its predecessor, and the added multiplayer components only further add to the game's robust feature set. Doom was unlike anything anyone had ever seen before. Wolfenstein 3D may have opened the door into the FPS genre, but Doom was the one that blew it off its hinges. It was insanely popular, and received an overwhelmingly positive response from fans and critics alike. It received several Game of the Year awards, and is still considered by many as one of the most influential video games of all time. In fact, the game was so popular upon release that it crashed several network servers, forcing universities and companies to put strict bans on students and employees attempting to download and play the game. On top of this, the game also generated a ton of controversy in the early 90s. Video games were only just starting to incorporate high levels of gore, with games like Mortal Kombat prompting US congressional hearings only a week before Doom's release. As expected, the game was criticized by a few for its satanic imagery and excessive violence, and was frequently used as the scapegoat for mass violence, including the Columbine Massacre of 1999. But these controversies were minor when compared to the overwhelming success of the game. Doom helped to establish the backbone of the FPS for the next decade, completely overshadowing the contributions of other FPS games released around the same time. And with fans desperate for more demon-killing action, id Software immediately began development on a sequel, one that would build upon the original success.
With Doom 2, development went a lot more smoothly. All the tools were already made, so the focus shifted more towards expanding upon the initial formula. More demonic creatures were created, a new weapon was introduced, and Sandy Peterson, along with newcomer American McGee, pieced together even more complex stages, filled with more challenging layouts and enemy configurations. Only 10 months after the first game, id Software released their highly anticipated follow-up, Doom 2 Hell on Earth. Doom 2 takes place directly after the cliffhanger at the end of Doom's final episode, Inferno, where Hell's forces have managed to invade Earth itself. The player continues to play the role of the Doom guy, and are forced to kill even more demonic creatures as they attempt to rid the world of the unwelcome visitors. Like before, Doom 2 doesn't emphasize its story. Everything is explained through text logs at the start of episodes. Though, interestingly, there is no longer a map screen indicating the player's progress in the narrative, highlighting an even greater desire to steer away from story and just let players kill crazy monsters. Doom 2 plays almost the same as its predecessor. Players explore maze-like environments, fight increasingly more challenging enemies, and pick up powerful weapons along the way. However, Doom 2 mixes up the formula with the introduction of several new enemy types, including the Arachnotrons, Hell Knights, Heavy Weapon Dudes, the Revenant, the Archfile, Pain Elementals, and the Mencubus. These enemies greatly impact the flow of the action, forcing players to prioritize their attacks more carefully. The game's difficulty overall feels much less forgiving. Traps are more common, and large open-ended arenas require more precise movement and reaction times to keep under control. Doom 2 also introduces the fan-favorite Super Shotgun, a double-barrel sawed-off that deals significantly more damage than its pump-action counterpart, at the cost of its slower reload speed. Overall, Doom 2 makes only a few changes to the formula, though they do make for a much more fast-paced and intense experience, something that only further strengthened the series' popularity. It was met with a familiar positive response, with many praising the game for its complex level designs and increased enemy variety, though a few criticized it for failing to innovate. Nothing about the game was technically different from the original, making it feel more like an expansion pack than an entirely separate product. As id Software handled distribution for Doom 2, they also supported the original game as well. They released multiple ports for several systems including the Sega Genesis 32, Atari Jaguar, SNES, and, with the help of Williams Entertainment, the original PlayStation. They even released an updated version for MDOS called The Ultimate Doom, complete with a bonus fourth episode to convince newcomers to jump into the series. Doom 2, however, didn't get quite the same level of multi-platform support. It received a couple of expansions like the Master Levels and the Final Doom, both of which were created mostly by third-party level creators. But the core game itself never saw releases on other console platforms at the time, likely because of all the tactical compromises that had to be made previously that just wouldn't be possible with a more ambitious sequel. But despite this, Doom hype was at an all-time high, and Doom Tomb became the best-selling computer game of the year. At this point, practically everyone had heard of Doom. Its popularity transcended the relatively small computer gaming community and became a worldwide phenomenon, turning id Software into legends in the industry. And of course, it didn't take long for other development studios to take notice. As fan-made levels and distribution continued to grow around the title, the Age of Doom clones arrived soon after, spawning countless titles all based on Carmack's graphical architecture. Games like Heretic, Hexen, Duke Nukem, Star Wars Dark Forces, and countless more flooded the market, and were all subsequently given the name Doom clones for lack of a better genre-defining term. Unsurprisingly, this got old fast, and id Software recognized that they would need to continue to innovate if they were to remain relevant moving forward. In 1996, id Software did just that, with the groundbreaking new shooter Quake that, unlike Doom, featured real-time 3D rendering, full polygon-based character models, and more advanced lighting effects. It was the natural next step for the company, and as the team continued to build on this new shooter series, they had the team responsible for the PlayStation version of Doom work on a separate port, this time for the N64. The N64 was unlike any console platform the Doom series had been introduced to before. It was more powerful than the likes of the Super Nintendo or Sega 32, and allowed for far more sophisticated visual techniques, including the first instance of 3D accelerated visual effects for the series. Environments were built to be darker, the color palette was expanded, and enemies were redesigned, giving them a more sinister look. The result was an entirely different Doom experience altogether, that released at the end of March 1997. Doom 64 takes place after the events of Doom 1 and 2, 
with Hell's forces having been defeated and pushed back to the moons around Mars. However, a mysterious new foe emerges and begins to revive all the slain demons, forcing the Doom Guy to kill them all over again. As usual, the story is basically non-existent, staying true to the classic format, and the gunplay retains its classic feel, only with a few notable changes. All the iconic weapons return, like the double barrel shotgun, plasma rifle, and chain gun, but some weapons have been altered slightly, with the chainsaw now featuring dual blades, and the rocket launcher causing players to kick back slightly after firing. Doom 64 also introduces a brand new weapon called the Unmaker, that can be upgraded throughout the game to be even more powerful. There's also a few new enemies to deal with, like the cloaked Nightmare Imps, though some classics like the Revenants don't make a return appearance. Levels in Doom 64 are not only darker, but much more complex. Keys, switches, and portals play almost as big a role as the gunplay this time, and often require the player to sprint quickly from point to point to progress further. Levels are also typically much more narrow and claustrophobic, requiring even more careful maneuvering to avoid being overwhelmed by powerful enemies like the Barons of Hell. Midway did initially intend to include a multiplayer deathmatch mode, a hallmark of the Doom series, but they were ultimately forced to scrap the idea, making Doom 64 the first title in the series to not feature a deathmatch mode. A major missed opportunity, especially considering what Rare was about to unleash on the platform later that same year. This, coupled with the exclusivity of the title on the N64, ultimately made Doom 64 one of the most underappreciated Doom games, as its excellent level designs and challenging combat encounters were credited by many as being some of the very best in the series. But at the same time, gamers had begun to move away from the Doom series. Quake's release essentially marked the beginning of a new age for the FPS, and Doom 64, despite being entirely different, was viewed by many as just yet another port of the classic title. Meanwhile, new games like Turok the Dinosaur Hunter and Rare's 007 Goldeneye had begun to dominate the scene, with completely unique and more expansive experiences unseen before in the FPS genre. Doom was beginning to lose its relevance in the industry, and moving into the new millennium, id Software aimed to save its most iconic property from being lost to the ages. After the hugely successful Quake 2 and Quake 3 arena continues to define the PC gaming scene in the late 90s, id Software had begun discussing options for future steps regarding the Doom series. Many employees at id Software expressed an immense desire to remake Doom from the ground up, with improved visuals and more modern shooter gameplay mechanics. According to an internal memo released by John Carmack, the idea of rebooting Doom was not something everyone at the company was on board with, echoing similar creative disputes during the original Doom's development. But with Grey Matter Interactive's success with Return to Castle Wolfenstein, the path forward became clear. After some minor staff restructuring, a reboot of Doom entered full production, with John Carmack once again leading the way with even more technological advancements aimed to push the industry forward. The latest engine architecture, now known as id Tech 4, allowed for far more advanced per-pixel lighting effects, along with an increased emphasis on scripted animations and environmental interactivity. With these tools at hand, the team was able to completely reimagine the UAC headquarters, with narrow industrial corridors and advanced lighting effects, all creating a much more horror-oriented tone. To accompany this new direction, id Software reached out to a science fiction writer to construct the game's narrative, and even utilize storyboarding to help organize their ideas. The goal was to recreate things from the original Doom games, but with substantially more depth, allowing players to have a better understanding of why enemies looked the way they did, and what Hell's motive was for attacking in the first place. Throughout the course of the next few years, id Software's reboot of Doom was shown off at several major game conferences, most notably E3 in 2002, where Doom fans were blown away by the next-gen visuals and immersive new experience. After a major leak of the E3 demo, the game continued a lengthy development cycle for the next two years, and in August of 2004, Doom 3 was released for the PC with an Xbox 360 port following a year later. Doom 3's story is essentially a reimagined version of the original Doom. Players once again take on the role of an unnamed space marine, who, along with a squad of other marines, are stranded on a Mars research base after demonic forces invade through an experimental gateway. And just like before, players are forced to fight their way through the facility in Hell itself to prevent the forces of evil from taking over their realm. But unlike the classic Doom games, Doom 3 takes an entirely different approach to its storytelling. Lengthy dialogue and cutscene sequences now help to establish the game's characters and plot, and new interactive environmental elements like computer terminals and wounded soldiers help to expand on the world's lore. 
Players can even uncover secret codes from emails and data logs that allow them to unlock secure lockers filled with helpful equipment. Adding incentive to really take in the UAC facility and the now unbreathable surface of Mars itself. Doom 3 even establishes a more distinct villain character this time around, who continually taunts the player thanks to the enhanced audio design. <laughs> Between Petruger's evil omnipresent laughter and the significantly darker environments, Doom 3 establishes a more horror-oriented tone. In fact, it was widely considered at the time as one of the scariest video games ever made, and this focus on horror inevitably had a major impact on the gameplay direction as well. While the classic Dooms emphasize fast-paced action and environmental exploration, Doom 3 is much slower paced and linear in its design. In fact, the introductory sequence is so slow paced that it takes almost 30 minutes before players are even faced with an enemy to shoot. Many familiar elements from Doom 1 and 2 return, including most of the weapons and enemy types. Though the new horror-oriented design changes how they function almost entirely. Weapons, for example, now need to be reloaded, leaving players vulnerable if they're not careful enough. And enemies like zombified soldiers now know how to take cover, requiring players to either wait for them to re-emerge or utilize explosives like the new grenades to draw them out. Imps still throw fireballs at the player, but they now also jump at the player, making them much more agile and threatening. Some enemies, like the Pinky, are given more of a boss-like role in the experience, only appearing in small numbers as opposed to the large herds from before. But surprisingly, all this works well to provide a fresh new take on the classic property. The pitch black atmosphere coupled with the game's flashlight that can't be equipped at the same time as the weapon gives Doom 3 its own unique personality. The game even includes several new features like weapons and enemies. New enemy types include lots of basic zombies, the maggots, wraiths, and swarms of smaller enemies like trites and ticks, all requiring different methods from the player. Doom 3 was met with mostly positive reception from gaming journalists and fans alike. The game was praised for its unprecedented steps forward in graphical technology, along with its new terrifying horror-oriented tone. However, not everyone was on board with the franchise's new direction. Many complained that the game deviated too drastically from what made the original title so special. The slower pacing and cliché horror was found to be more frustrating than scary, and the game's requirement to swap back and forth between weapons and flashlight were widely criticized, with many joking that Mars was apparently suffering from a shortage of duct tape. The game was even compared to its initial E3 showings, with some noting that the retail version failed to live up to early promises. But ultimately, Doom 3 was a huge success, and even inspired a major motion picture starring Dwayne The Rock Johnson only a year later. In October of 2004, id Software announced a follow-up expansion for Doom 3 titled Resurrection of Evil, which offers a new campaign experience developed both by id in combination with Nerve Software, who had previously worked on the multiplayer mode for Grey Matter's Return to Castle Wolfenstein. This expansion sees the return of the iconic Super Shotgun, along with a few brand new tools including the Grabber, that can pick up objects and throw them around like Half-Life 2's Gravity Gun, and the Artifact, that can slow down time temporarily to allow players to get the jump on enemies or bypass obstacles. Resurrection of Evil scored decent reviews overall. Many journalists noted the more challenging design and increased gameplay variety, but others criticized it for failing to innovate, and even borrowing unique ideas from other developers. Following the lukewarm success of Doom 3 and its expansion, id Software went quiet for several years. They instead collaborated with smaller studios like Fountainhead Entertainment and created various mobile spin-offs of their classic properties, including a role-playing version of Doom. But the future of the mainline series remained unclear. Then, during QuakeCon 2007, Carmack confirmed that a fourth Doom title was in development, but he still remained vague, only mentioning that the new title would take place on Earth again after Hal had invaded, and that the game engine technology would be even more advanced. The engine Carmack hinted at would eventually be adopted into id Software's next major project, Rage, an open-world shooter game that would take advantage of id Software's reputation for solid shooting mechanics, but would ultimately disappoint longtime fans with what felt like a clear disconnect from the studio's core values. Additionally, the engine itself almost felt like a step back, with less dynamic lighting and serious texture streaming issues. Around the same time, id Software also re-released Doom 3 in a collection called the BFG Edition, complete with the remastered versions of Doom 3 and its expansion, along with a bonus Lost mission to play. This version of Doom 3 addresses the controversial flashlight design, allowing players to turn on a new shoulder-mounted flashlight instead. 
On top of that, the BFG edition also includes ports of the original Ultimate Doom and Doom 2, and even includes a brand new episode called No Rest for the Living. And while this sounds like the Ultimate Package, this version of the game has been widely criticized for abandoning the creative design of the original Doom 3. The flashlight swapping, while arguably a frustrating feature, was a core part of the gameplay design. And without it, Doom 3 BFG feels like a very basic survival shooter, especially when compared to other titles in the early 2010s. Meanwhile, older properties like Wolfenstein and Quake were also being churned out by different development studios, with a new narrative-driven Quake, highly reminiscent of Doom 3's visual style and direction, and a reboot of Wolfenstein that felt more like a modification of Call of Duty than its own distinct property. After Rage finally released in 2011 and was met with a mixed response, the team turned back to Doom again, but early concepts demonstrated many of the same poor design choices. The game was slow-paced, looked derivative, and had almost nothing in common with what fans typically associated with Doom. One of the biggest problems identified with this early build was how much it relied on scripted narrative sequences and dialogue, a trend that was popularized by other conventional shooter games released around the same time. To avoid this trap, id Software made the costly decision to scrap Doom 4 almost completely, saving only bits and pieces for later use. They quickly identified that in order to revive this once great franchise, they would have to shift their focus away from the narrative-driven experience and put heavy emphasis on increased player control and movement speed. Players need to be able to move fluidly through the environment and not get stopped every 10 minutes to talk to an NPC. Concepts like weapon reloading and having to wait for cutscenes were completely counterproductive, and were scrapped in favor of new mantling mechanics and open-ended stages. Around the same time, John Carmack finally parted ways with id Software, citing an increased desire to pursue virtual reality tech as the primary reason for his departure. In his place, id hired ex-Crytek programmer Tiago Sousa, who helped to finalize the design of the even more advanced id Tech 6 capable of streaming textures more efficiently without compromising the quality of lighting or shadows. But the most important contribution came from creative director Hugo Martin, who helped steer the game in the right direction. Martin recognized that while the original Dooms had some mature elements, they were ultimately very silly games, blasting demons from hell on Mars using laser guns and chainsaws, all while rocking out to heavy metal, that's what made Doom so much fun. Doom 3, while still a good game in its own right, abandoned the charm of the classic titles and Martin's goal was to bring that charm back. Finally, in 2014, Bethesda showed off a trailer for the redesigned Doom at E3, restoring faith in the project that many feared had become vaporware. The response from fans to Doom Guy grabbing iconic weapons like the Super Shotgun and Chainsaw proved without a doubt that Doom was finally coming back. And two years later, it did just that, as Doom was once again unleashed upon the world in summer of 2016. In this Doom reboot, players wake up inside a facility overrun by demonic creatures, and are instructed by the mysterious android Dr. Samuel Hayden to push back the Hellspawn and put a stop to a corrupted UAC researcher named Olivia Pierce. Staying true to the original games, the Doom reboot allows players to get right into the action. There are rarely any dialogue sequences outside of some crucial moments throughout the campaign, though just like Doom 3, players can expand their search around the game's environments to uncover data entries unlocking additional backstory for people that care. The story structure shares many similarities to past games, even Doom 3, with the UAC scientists opening a portal into hell and the player needing to travel back and forth between dimensions to put a stop to it all. But interestingly, this new story appears to be a continuation of the original plot, with the player's character now being referred to as the Doom Slayer, an evidence suggesting that hell itself now fears his return. There's also more reasoning behind the UAC's experimentation, as it's revealed that they are attempting to harness Hell's energy called Argent to benefit mankind. But of course, as always, the gameplay is the most important component of the experience, and the Doom reboot delivers one of the most ambitious experiences in the series to date. This game returns to its roots, with smoother movement and combat mechanics, and all the enemies and weapon models are based heavily off of id Software's designs from the early 90s. Almost all the classics return, including the Imps, Pinkies, Cacodemons, and Barons of Hell, though they're now even more aggressive, with multiple attacks and unique movement designs, forcing players to strafe and jump all over the place to survive. This game also introduces some new enemy types, like the Hellraisers that can engage from long range, the Summoner that functions like an arch file only with the ability to teleport and spawn new enemies into the fight, and several different variations of possessed humans like a security officer equipped with an energy shield. But players are more than equipped to deal with these enemies, as the arsenal is far more robust than any other game in the series before it. 
the super shotgun, the minigun, the rocket launcher, everything is available to use again, though they've been expanded significantly thanks to a new player progression system. Doom's progression system is one of the biggest changes to the design of the game. By completing specific challenges or collecting special Argent energy cells, players can equip many upgrades, allowing them to enhance their speed, durability, and power. Each weapon can now be equipped with found weapon attachments like rocket pods or underbarrel grenade launchers, and each attachment comes with their own set of special challenges to complete that can improve their functionality even further. And while all of this can seem pretty overwhelming, the game still manages to play more smoothly and fluid than any other Doom game in the series. Players can easily strafe around large environments, mantle up objects, and double jump to clear larger gaps. Players can even initiate a new takedown called the Glory Kill that will reward the player with extra health. Alternatively, using the iconic Chainsaw rewards the player with extra ammunition, giving it a much more practical use in the flow of the action. These new weapons and movement controls play a major role in combat encounters, that now offer a mix of freeform combat like the old games, along with scripted survival sequences after ripping apart things called Gorness. This triggers an intense battle, where the music increases in intensity and the enemies begin to spawn rapidly to challenge the player. The Doom reboot also features bonus rooms, requiring players to complete crazy challenges in order to unlock other special upgrades for their gear. Outside of the single-player experience, Doom 2016 also sees the return of online competitive deathmatch, only with a much more modern twist. Players no longer have to find weapons in the environment, but instead select from loadouts. Additionally, players can collect demon power-ups to temporarily slaughter their opponents as one of the many different hellish monsters likely influenced by the likes of Call of Duty and its popular Killstreak feature. And while this latest Doom does not feature the classic 4-player co-op mode, players can still team up together in the game's unique Snap Map mode, that allows players to easily build their own custom environments and campaigns using a simplified map editor tool. However, these tools are fairly limited when compared to the level of complexity offered in older map editor tools in classic Doom titles. Even so, Doom 2016 was a monumental success. Its smooth movement, incredible soundtrack, and faithful recreation of the franchise's classic weapons and monsters resonated strongly with fans and newcomers alike. After years of waiting, Doom had finally returned, bigger and better than ever before. The game's reviews were all mostly positive, with many applauding the game's visuals, combat mechanics, and new features. Though a few found the new glory kill system to be overly repetitive. It was designed to be optional, but the flow of the game essentially requires players to make use of it having to sit through very brief but repetitive takedown animations. Regardless, Doom 2016 was an undeniable hit in the industry, and with its success, id Software turned their attention back towards an emerging new technology that they were excited to take advantage of. Throughout the course of Doom 2016's development, id Software expressed significant interest in virtual reality gaming, and began to experiment with ways to incorporate VR into their classic properties. They eventually decided to adopt their gameplay formula from Doom 2016 into the virtual reality format, reworking some of the core game's environments and weapons to function in an immersive space. And within the next year, id Software released Doom VFR. Doom VFR puts players literally in the boots of a UAC scientist named Dr. Peters, who, after suffering a brutal mauling from a pinky demon in an elevator, is revived partially by a series of high-tech machines, suspending his consciousness in a computer matrix. Using this to his advantage, Peters then transfers his brain into a robot, giving players the opportunity to move around the UAC facility in full VR, providing an entirely new perspective to the Doom experience. Players can use the VR's controllers to teleport around the game world, and can simultaneously aim using their alternate controller, firing all of the most iconic weapons. Surprisingly, Doom VFR provides an incredibly steep difficulty curve, introducing some powerful enemies like the Mancubus and Revenants within only the first few sequences, challenging players to quickly make use of the new teleporting feature to stay alive. Though this does make sense considering the game's incredibly short campaign, with only roughly an hour and a half of gameplay from start to finish. But being able to stand at the feet of a cyber demon is quite possibly one of the most surreal experiences available in the Doom series even if it does make me dizzy for the next 12 hours. Doom VFR is the lowest rated title in the entire series. The game's short length, its initial requirement to use only the teleportation method for movement, and months of technical issues upon release have resulted in a mixed audience response, though it's undoubtedly one of the more unique experiences in the franchise's history. But the VR spin-off was not the only thing id Software was focused on. Doom 2016 had, after all, left off with a massive cliffhanger, 
and based on the story presented in the classic games, it was only a matter of time until Hell found its way back to Earth. And at E3 2018, Bethesda Softworks confirmed the existence of a direct sequel, with the announcement of Doom Eternal, the spiritual remake of the original Doom 2. But this time, the Doom Slayers got a lot more tricks up his sleeve. Players once again controlled the Doom Slayer, only in a new Hell-possessed version of his classic suit, equipped with a shoulder-mounted rocket launcher and an extendable wrist blade, perfect for slicing through enemies in the improved glory kill system. Players are even given more tools to improve their maneuverability, including a grapple hook to slingshot off of enemies, and the ability to swing on specific horizontal bars around the environment. Players will also be challenged with significantly more demons, including several returning enemies like the Pain Elemental and the Archvile. Unfortunately, Doom Eternal won't feature a traditional deathmatch multiplayer mode this time around, though it does come with a brand new style of competitive play called Battle Mode, where two player-controlled demons team up against a player controlling the Doom Slayer for an intense asymmetrical showdown. This software also plans on releasing a version of this mode that allows teams to invade a single player's campaign, though this should always be entirely optional. So far, Doom Eternal is shaping up to be one of the most ambitious entries in the entire franchise, and I'll be sure to provide full coverage of the game when it releases next week, including a detailed comparison to the previous game, along with a final review soon after its release on March 20th. Doom has had a monumental impact on the gaming industry. What started as a small passion project between five young game developers in the 90s has grown to become one of the most well-known and cherished first-person shooter franchises of all time. It is directly responsible for hundreds of different gaming experiences thanks to its revolutionary technology and simple game mechanics. It is one of the very few franchises that has ever managed to properly return to its roots. Despite their age and obviously dated visuals, the original games are still, even 27 years later, just as enjoyable to play through, and even sport some dedicated fan communities, with players still actively participating in WAD designs and deathmatches every day. Doom isn't just a fantastic franchise, it's a legendary one. And as long as id Software stays true to the series' core roots, gamers will always come back to rip and tear some more. But what do you guys think? Which Doom experience has been your favorite? And where do you think id Software should take the series next? Let me know in the comments section. Also, I wanted to give a special shout out to my gold member Patreons, including B-Man, James Kafka, Kung Fu Hot Dog, James Taylor, and Uriel Tomsoff. Your continued support is greatly appreciated. If you also want to help out, please consider becoming a member of my Patreon. You'll get early access to each month's documentary, access to our private Discord to chat about upcoming releases with like-minded gamers, and exclusive behind-the-scenes content. Additionally, if we get enough support, I'll begin to scale back the ads on these videos so that you can have an uninterrupted experience. If you're interested in helping out, be sure to check the link provided in the description below. Otherwise, thank you for watching, and of course, don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos posted every week.